His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, He is the King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful. see everyone here this morning and if you're joining us online uh, we want to welcome you as well and um, as we enter into our period of worship this morning and if you're visiting with us we're glad you came our way and invite you to fill out one of the visitors cards in the pew in front of you and put it in one of the boxes at the at the uh, exit as you leave today and hang around a little bit and let us get to meet you it's always a good day to get together and worship the Lord. It should be the high point of our week. So, uh, since my voice isn't cracking this morning, I think I'll still kind of cut it short and we'll stand for the psalm this time. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people's with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion, proclaim among the nations what he has done. In the field I would wield sickles brave and true. In the fight for the right I would dare and do. Spend my days in thy praise all my journey through. Let me live close to thee each day. Let me live.
Good morning, church. Will you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, first of all, to give you praise and give you thanks, Lord, for all the good things that you do for us, Lord, for all the good things that you provide for us. We give you thanks, Lord, for allowing us to, to be here and giving us the health to be here, Lord, to worship you and just for, um, for being our Lord. We want to ask you, Lord, to watch over us today as, as we worship you. We ask that you be present in our worship service, and we ask that we pray that our worship is glorifying to you, Lord, and beneficial to each one of our, of our members here and, and those who are watching online, Lord, and we just pray that uh, we can be shining lights for you, Lord, and that we can be the people that you call us to be. Um, I ask, Lord, that you be with our church as we uh, look for new deacons, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that uh, you open up uh, the hearts of these men, Lord, who are nominated, and we just ask that you that you be with them and that you be with our church and with the elders through all this process. Um, we ask you, Lord, to, again, Lord, to just be with each one of us through the week and help us be um, good representatives of you. Um, watch over us for the rest of the day or for the rest of the week, Lord, and it's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Why did my Savior heaven leave and come to earth below, where men morning church if uh, you'd like to participate in communion you've not received a communion package like this with the bread and the cup there are some gentlemen going down the aisle right now and they would be happy to provide you one if you just raise your hand and let them know in Hebrews chapter 10 what we know is verse 5 our Savior the Christ talks about his sacrifice. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, 
He said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. God had given direction to Moses when the children of Israel were leaving Exodus and getting ready to start their new lives in Canaan about how they were to remember God and honor God through sacrifices with fire and beings that God had created. But Christ realized that those sacrifices were no longer because he was going to provide the final sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice of his love through his body and his blood. And so this morning we are here together as a family of brothers and sisters to remember what Jesus did for us in that sacrifice, that ultimate sacrifice. Will you bow with me? Dear God, we thank you so much for this time that we have in our worship to you to remember our Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer, to remember what he had to go through, the suffering that he had to go through because he loved us so much and because you loved us so much. And as we now partake of this bread in our remembrance, of him we remember that body that was nailed to the cross for us dear god we now take this emblem of this unleavened bread into our bodies to remember his bodies and we ask that you bless this bread and bless us as we partake of it and this we pray in jesus name amen time of the Old Testament sacrifices, the Levitical priests that were in charge of those and had helped with make it happen for the people of Israel, there was a lot of cleansing. And now we are able to remember that the blood of Christ cleans us, washes our sin away. So will you bow with me now as we partake of this fruit of the vine together. Dear God, we thank you so much for your creation of this fruit, for this ability to be able to put it to our lips and into our bodies to remember the blood that was shed for us by our Savior, Jesus. Dear God, we ask that you bless it, and we ask that you bless us as we partake of it. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We remember Jesus' sacrifice, but we also remember that we can sacrifice too. 
Because of the blessings that God has given us, we can sacrifice so that those outside these walls and inside our walls can be taken care of like God expects us to take care of them as a family here at Netherwood. And so at this time, we have many different ways that we can give, and we have our hearts to be able to reach out to and determine what we need to give and when we need to give. God lets us have that choice, so we want to thank him now for the resources we have and for the choices that we do have because of him. Will you bow with me? Dear God, we thank you so much that we have this family here that is full of blessings, that is full of talent and full of resources. And dear God, we know that you not only command us, but you are joyful that we are able to use those talents and resources to give back, to be able to help others to understand you and to more importantly know the gospel of Jesus Christ and what we just remembered. Dear God, we thank you. And we thank you so much for your son. Who we pray this prayer in his name. Amen. If you would be standing uh, as we stand and sing, uh, the children's worship is being done down the hall, <clears throat> down the ramp, uh, two-year-old through second uh, kindergarten. I always mess that up. Um, Y'all be heading down that way. <clears throat> they tried my Lord and Master.
Good morning. morning. This morning our scripture reading is going to be Psalms 23. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, thy comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. You know, that was actually pretty good. So I'm still going to make you do it again, but you always aspire to greater things. Uh, and so let's make sure we're all awake this morning. I know we're excited. The weather's getting good outside. It's getting closer to spring. Uh, maybe. I don't know for sure. But let's do that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for that, guys. I just want to welcome you. I've met some uh, visitors and some guests today I haven't met before. We are glad that you are here worshiping with us. But it's not just here that we worship, but there are many people online who are joining us either now or will watch us later. So let's turn around and wave to those online and even to Rick and all the guys up there in the booth. On three, let's say good morning, church. One, two, three. Good morning, church. So there was a couple named Wayne and Anna, and they were minister and wife in Hawaii. Which, first of all, if you are a minister and wife in Hawaii, your life can't be that bad. But this was years ago when money went a lot further than it does now. And Wayne and Anna were given a gift certificate to a really nice restaurant in the area. And they got excited because it was $100 to this restaurant, which would cover an entire meal, which now barely covers a happy meal at McDonald's. But so Wayne and Anna got really excited. They booked a reservation at the restaurant, and that night they dressed to the nines. Anna got a nice dress. Wayne took a shower. He put on deodorant. He put on cologne. Some of you men could learn from this. And Wayne even went and got their car clean and waxed because they wanted to take it through the valet. And he didn't want anyone to look down on him and his Ford Pinto. But regardless, they were really excited for this dinner. And when the night came, they drove their Ford Pinto to the valet. They dropped it off. They went inside the restaurant and were brought to a beautiful table that looked out on a lagoon at moonlight. I mean, it was picturesque. Wayne and Anna looked the part because this was a restaurant that only rich people went to. They dressed the part. And when it came to the food, well, they ordered the best things on the menu. They had $100, and they were going to spend every penny of it. If you were to look at Wayne and Anna in the restaurant, you would think that they were rich because they looked like they belonged there. Well, after the meal, the, t the ticket was about to come, and Wayne said to Anna, he said, Hey, it's about time you give me the gift certificate so I can pay for the meal. Anna says, I don't have the gift certificate. I thought you had it. Wayne says, no, you're the wife. You have to have the gift certificate. That's your job. They were in trouble. And we could laugh at this story because it's, it's going to be kind of hard. Some of you might have experienced this before. But the point that I want to make is not the fact that they were going to have to pay for a meal they weren't expecting. But Wayne and Anna looked the part. They dressed like they were rich. They were eating like they were rich. But when the bill came and they were going to have trouble paying for it, 
they weren't who they claimed to be. Because sometimes we claim to be one thing when we're really not. And sometimes when it comes to being followers of Jesus, we claim to be good and faithful followers. But our actions show we are not who we claim to be. I want to look at this idea this morning of being good and faithful followers to Jesus as we look at John chapter 10. So come and see this morning as we see what it means to be good sheep. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10. I have it up here on the screen as well, but if you're looking for the Gospel of John, it's in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, then John. And I'm going to encourage you this morning to save this place because we're going to bounce back between it and a book in the Old Testament later. So this is what John chapter 10 verses 1 through 10 tells us this morning. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow the voice of a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this as a figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. As we read in our Bibles this morning, Jesus is going to use two metaphors. He's going to talk about himself being a gate, and later we'll talk about him being the good shepherd. But before we dive into our text this morning, I want us to all ask ourselves this question. Am I being a good sheep? Sheep don't often get, you know, good reputations in our Bibles. But often, God's people are known as sheep. In the Old Testament, God's people are referred to as his flock. But we don't want to be called sheep because often they're not the smartest animals around. Sheep are often used as animals to describe people because they need guidance, they are helpless, and they need protection. But God uses the metaphor for his people to talk about them as sheep many times in the Bible. And as I said, we're going to look at an Old Testament passage this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn over to Ezekiel chapter 34. As some of you, like me, sometimes struggle with figuring out where Ezekiel is, it's after the book of Lamentations, right before the book of Daniel. In my Bible, I can tell you that that chapter, if you're looking for it, is on page 936. So that gives you an idea to help you out. But there's a, in this chapter, it talks about God's people and the shepherds of Israel. And so as we can see on this screen up here, I picked out a few verses here this morning to talk about God's people as sheep or the flock. Ezekiel 34 verse 6 tells us this. It says, My sheep have wandered over all the mountains on, and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Ezekiel 34.11 says this, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. And finally, at the end of the chapter, Ezekiel 34, verse 31, You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I, and I am your God, declares the Sovereign Lord. So whether we want to admit it, we are like sheep. We are a part of God's flock. 
And God offers us protection. God offers us pasture. But sometimes as God's sheep, we go astray. And so this morning, I want us to, us to keep asking ourselves the same question. Am I being a good sheep? Am I one who's not being pulled away by thieves and robbers? Am I a good sheep who is not listening to the voice of the stranger, but following the voice of my shepherd? And as a good sheep, am I okay with the pastures that God has led me to? Because as we're talking about all these metaphors, let's talk about sheep a little bit more. So what I have pictured for you here, it's the best one I could find. This is what's called a sheep pen or a sheep fold. If I use those words interchangeably this morning, know it's the same thing. I just get mixed up sometimes. But this is what it would have looked like. A sheep pen or a sheep fold is an area that is enclosed where the sheep are kept. Often in the first century, they would build these up against a mountain or a hill to offer a little bit more protection. And as you can see, there are multiple walls built to protect the sheep. Inside the pen, the sheep are safe. What you might be able to see somewhere in the middle of this picture, there's a hole where a gate would be. Because the gate separated the sheep from the pasture and the pen. Inside the sheep pen, the sheep are safe. Outside in the pasture, the sheep go for nourishment. There is one way in, and there is one way out. There is just the gate. And this is why Jesus calls himself the gate. And we're going to get to that a little bit here in a second. But in John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Jesus is talking about a greater metaphor here for eternal life and for salvation. Jesus is the gate for his sheep. If God's people are the sheep, he is the gate that keeps them inside the pen for protection, but he is also the gate they will pass through for life and nourishment leading to eternal life. There is only one gate in the sheep pen. There is one way in and one way out. And while we could talk about what this means for us, I do want us to think about if we're going to be good sheep, sh good sheep don't look for other exits. If you're inside this sheep pen and God is protecting you, you're not looking for another way out. You are content in the sheep pen that God has designed for you. You're not looking for a back door. You're not looking for an exit. You're not looking for a way outside the sheep pen. You are content as a good sheep in what God has given you. But sometimes when we think about ourselves and what we need in our life, we think we're good enough that we can somehow figure it out on our own and we don't need Jesus. We might say Jesus is the one gate that leads to life and nourishment, but sometimes I think I can earn my way into my salvation. We tell ourselves, well, I give of my time. I give money to church. I come on Sundays and Wednesdays. I serve in a ministry, and hey, when there's that homeless guy out there on the street, I give him my leftovers, or I give him a $20 bill. I have done A, B, and C, therefore I deserve X, Y, and Z. I have done enough in my life that I know in the end that if I were to go to heaven right now, God would call me his good and faithful servant because I have earned my salvation. That's not how it works. Jesus says he is the gate. There is one way in and one way out. You're con if you're a good sheep, you're content inside the pen. If you're a good sheep, you're watching out for thieves and robbers because as it says, they've only come to steal, kill, and destroy. If you're looking out, you're not saying that thief is going to steal me away from God. 
If you're a good sheep, you know that those robbers are just going to rob you of the joy, hope, and salvation found in God. And if you're a good sheep, you know the stranger's voice might sound sweet, but it does not lead to life. It only leads to death. If you are a good sheep, you're not looking for another exit to a greener pasture out there. Because good sheep don't look for exits. Because as Jesus says, there is only one gate. If you want salvation, you have to find it in Jesus. You don't do anything to earn your salvation. Jesus is the only one who gives us salvation, and he'll talk about that more in the next section. But if you think you've done enough to earn your salvation, that's not how it works. I don't work to say I'm good enough. Jesus died saying I was good enough, and I live for him each and every day as a reminder that he is greater than me. There is one way in, and there is one way out. If you're a good sheep, you're not looking for an exit. The only way to salvation and to receive salvation is through Jesus and his death on the cross. But if we're talking about this metaphor of a sheep pen and a sheepfold, we know it's good and safe inside this, this gate, inside the sheep pen, inside the walls. But as Jesus says, he opens the gate and we go out to pasture. What happens when we're out there getting nourishment? Aren't we susceptible to being attacked by something else? This is what Jesus says in John chapter 11, verses, John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. And this is what our Bibles tell us. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay down and the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So it seems kind of weird. We had this metaphor of Jesus as the gate, but now he talks about himself being a shepherd? I mean, aren't these competing ideas? Well, here's how Jesus can be both. Because shepherding are metaphors for leadership and guidance here in our Bibles. Good leaders were known as good shepherds. And even in our Bibles, God is called a shepherd of his people. As the shepherd of of his people, he watches over his flock. He tends to them and he takes care of them. And even when it seems like God's flock is going away and astray, God goes to find them and bring them back. I mean, the, the Bible reading we had this morning, Psalm chapter 23, it says, the Lord is my... There we go. Good job, guys. The Lord is my shepherd. Exactly. But even, there are many metaphors for God being the good shepherd of his people as a good leader, but this... Metaphor would also be used for the leaders of Israel and God's people. There are two people here who are known as shepherds. There are probably many more. One of them is Joshua. And if you put that scripture up there, Joshua 27, verses 16 and 17, this is Moses understanding he's going to die, and he wants the people to be led by someone good. And at the end of verse 17, it says, So the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Joshua was that shepherd of the people to continue to lead them on. 
But even kings in our Bible were known as shepherds. One of our great kings, King David, was known as a shepherd of God's people. At the end of of Psalm 78, verses 70 through 72, it says, And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands he led them. If you were a good leader, you were a good shepherd because God's people were the flock. And as a shepherd, you took care of them. But this is why I also chose Ezekiel chapter 34. Because the people were not being good leaders. They needed a true leader to guide them. And this is what it says in Ezekiel 34. I'm going to start at verse 2. It says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who not only take care of your who only take care of yourselves. Should should not shepherds take care of the flock? And God's issue with the shepherds is that they were filling themselves. They were taking care of themselves. They weren't looking after God's people, going after them if they went astray, taking care of them if they were sick. They were bad leaders who were being bad shepherds. So this is why back in John chapter 10, Jesus says he is the good shepherd. And if you notice, Jesus says that phrase twice. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Because there is no other shepherd like Jesus. And this is why he is different than all the rest. Once the sheep are led out of the sheep pen, out into the pasture, they're out there eating and getting their nourishment. But out there in the pasture, there are predators watching out for them. There could be wolves, there could be bears, there could be any sort of animal who want to prey on the sheep. And it was the shepherd's job to protect the sheep in the pasture. Now if a wolf or a bear came up and were to attack one of the sheep, a shepherd might try to guard the sheep and fend for it. But there were some shepherds who would just say, well, that sheep got taken away. It is what it is. We're just going to move on and I'm going to take care of the rest of them. But a good shepherd would put their life on the line. They would get in between the animal and their sheep and protect it. And this is why Jesus says he is the good shepherd. Because if we are the flock, Jesus is going to get between us and the predators, the sin, Satan, whatever you want to call it. And he is willing to put his life on the line to protect us so that we can have life and we will be okay. Some shepherds just might defend so the sheep can get away, but Jesus is willing to die for us. And we know this is true because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Jesus is the gate, but Jesus is also our good shepherd. Because there is only one way in and one way out. Inside the pen we are protected, but we pass through Jesus and we are forgiven and we can be baptized and we find salvation in him. But while we are out in the pasture and the predators still try to come at us, Jesus is the good shepherd who is constantly watching over us. He is both our gate and the good shepherd. But what does this mean for us? We talked about how this is about us. We are supposed to be good sheep. Well, good sheep know their shepherd. It says there twice in this section, in John John 10, 1 through 18, it says shepherds, sorry, sheep know their shepherd's voice. Sheep know their shepherds. Do you know Jesus' voice? Because there are many voices out there competing for your attention, trying to pull you away from Jesus, but do you hear him clearly over everything else? Are you being a good sheep who only knows the voice of your shepherd, who doesn't care about thieves and robbers? 
Are you one of the good sheep who follows your shepherd and sticks close by them in the pasture, even when the predators are lurking around? As it says in our Bible, Satan is like a prowling lion wandering around waiting to devour us. Do I know that my shepherd has my back? As a good sheep, when you're out in the pasture, are you content with that pasture? Or are you looking at other hills saying, my life would be so much better over there. My life would be so much more fun over there. I could have so much more in life if I went over to that other pasture, because where I am right now just isn't cutting it. Am I being a good sheep who knows the voice of my shepherd? So right now, Annabeth and I are in a book reading challenge. I know this is a weird segue. I didn't have one this morning. But we're doing a reading challenge that we started at the beginning of the year. And we're going through at the end of the year. And by the end of the year, we're hoping to have read 60 books combined. It's two months in. I think I've read about three books. Annabeth's on about 15, so she's obviously carrying us right now. But one of the books that I just finished reading was one some of you might have heard before, but it's called Not a Fan. Not a Fan is a book about how we as followers of God should be more than just fans, because fans aren't fully committed like followers. And I would encourage you to read this book because it's pretty challenging, and I admit that I got upset at the book. I thought it was wrong. But there were more areas in my life that I didn't want to admit that I'm more of a fan rather than a committed follower. And so here's what the author has some things to say about the difference between fans and followers. It says that fans say what they believe. Followers live out their beliefs through committed actions. Fans know about Jesus. Followers intimately know Jesus. Fans follow Jesus in their own circles, on their own time, and when it's convenient. Followers live for Christ whenever, wherever, and do whatever Jesus calls them to do. There are many more ways where he talks about being a fan or being a follower rather than a fan, but I'm wondering if we changed some of those words around this morning and said, there's a difference between being a sheep and being a good sheep. Because just like Wayne and Anna, you can blend in with everyone else. You can look the part, you can speak the part, and you can act the part. But when push comes to shove, are you who you truly act like you are? Are you, can you truly say that you are a good sheep rather than just a sheep? That is the hard thing that we have to consider. And if you're asking yourself this this question this morning, how do I know I'm a good sheep? Well, look no further than John chapter 10. You know you're a good sheep if you enter and exit through one gate. That you don't fall prey to thieves and robbers. You don't listen to the voice of strangers. You only look to Jesus for your salvation. You know Jesus is your shepherd. You know Jesus protects you. You know that Jesus has put and placed you in the right pastures. And you live faithfully because you know Jesus died for you on the cross. And even this morning, if you can say, well, I'm one of the good sheep. How are you living to bring other sheep in who do not know Jesus? Are you talking about Jesus to your friends and family and also the strangers? Are you living faithfully as a good sheep on Monday and Tuesday, not just Sunday mornings? Are you being a good sheep? That's the question I want to leave us with this morning. Am I being a good sheep? Because it's not enough just to say that I'm part of the flock, but I live differently because Jesus died for me. This morning, if you're asking yourself this question, am I a good sheep, and you want prayers, well, we'll pray for you. 
This morning, you want to be a good sheep, and you want to dedicate your life to Christ through baptism or through study and get to know him more. If you want to be a good sheep and even find out how can you serve him more, not only in the church, but in, your, in the world as well, please come forward as we stand and sing. coming forward this morning to place membership with us, Trey White. I want to take your time to uh, meet him, get to know him. And if you wouldn't mind, Trey, you just kind of stand up for those who might not have met you yet. So <laughs> so glad to have you. He's wanting to get involved already, and that's what we like to hear, a man of action. So we're very glad to have you with us. I encourage you to Keep your bulletin. If you haven't gotten one, pick one up on the way out. Got a lot of information that's pertinent to the congregation, as well as news, and the most important part is our prayer list. We have many that have lost loved ones this week. And uh, also, uh, I don't know, the, a good way to keep up with this is for the names that have come out in prayer requests after uh, the bulletin has been published. Uh, it's a good idea if you haven't done so already to get on the Netherwood email for news and notes and a prayer request so you can add those to your prayer list. One that's not on here that uh, some of you know Peggy Lee, she had a very serious stroke uh, last week and I'm not sure where the status of that is now but it's not, wasn't looking good at that time. And also last night uh, we found out our, 
our son Dean's going to have surgery this afternoon on for a very serious ear uh, infection he's had for over a month now. So we, we'd like to you add those to your prayer list as well. Now, Deacon nomination form. This is the last day, February 25th, 2024. Not 2025, 2024. This is the last day. I received one already today, and so maybe some of the other elders have as well, but I encourage you to do that. And we're it's a very exciting time for our congregation. And you can do it by picking up one of these forms. It also gives you the other information how you can submit names and give them to either any of the elders or uh, put them in the box in the back, the collection box. You can also do it online. There's also a QR code, which I rarely ever have any good luck with, but uh, some of you might know how to do that. So that's three ways you can submit these names. We do encourage you to do that. It's very important to the life of any congregation. It's also a period of excitement. We Last few months, I feel a real buzz and let you know, yeah, I am excited. Just to let you know. And so, uh, really am. So, uh, somebody asked the other day, said they couldn't really tell. And I said, well, I'm surprised. But anyway, that's the way it is. Okay, I will have uh, a couple, uh, there will be, not, not me, a couple other announcements after we have our closing prayer. So, I ask you to remain seated. Uh, for Trevor will have one, and also then Fernando will have another one. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful you decided to allow us to be your children and developed a plan to do that. Help us realize how fortunate we are to be your children, and help us always strive to examine ourselves and to make sure we are truly what we profess to be. And if we're not, Father, give us the wisdom and the fortitude to make the changes necessary to be the type of sheep you'd have us to be. For those that are hurting in one way or another, Father, we pray that you'd be with them. Let them know you're near and give them the peace and comfort during their time of troubles. Pray you'd be with us at, with our deacon search, Father. Pray you would bless these efforts greatly and our main prayer, Father, is that the men that will become the new deacons will be the ones that you want to be installed in that position at this congregation. Pray you would guide all of us as, in whatever we do and help us realize that our ultimate goal is to stay close to you in this life and be an, in, and be an influence and a light to others. Be with us as we're going through a period of our classes, Father, and and watch over us always. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I just have my one announcement that I want to make. Uh, it's that today uh, our new members' luncheon is in the fellowship hall after Bible class. It is the West Fellowship Hall, the one with the kitchen. So if you have been invited to that and we've talked to you about it, please join us for that. But also, if you have questions about membership, you want to know more about Netherwood Park, please see one of our elders and talk to them about it. I know we have lots of visitors and guests that come in, and we want to welcome you in as family. Uh, but we hope you ask us questions about what's happening here at Netherwood Park. And so we are, this is the first one we're having in a while, but we hope to have more and more new members because we are out there sharing the gospel and God is leading us to new people. Uh, and so new members luncheon after Bible class in the fellowship hall, there is food provided. Uh, and so I'm sorry if you didn't get an invite. We will, uh, you're not the, the ones we want. I'm just kidding. Uh, we are, just, uh, hopefully you can celebrate with us in different ways. Uh, but uh, we hope to see those for the new member luncheon, uh, elders and new members afterwards. Like I said, if you have questions, please talk to an elder afterwards. Good morning again, church. Um, so a few months ago, I don't remember if it was right before New Year's or right after New Year's, but Trevor asked a question and said, how many of us have New Year's resolutions? 
and nobody raised their hands, including myself, right? Um, but if you're like me, I think that we put some resolutions in our heart, and like mine is always to be more involved, and which of course usually trickles down some, somewhere along the year, right? Um, but I want to invite all of you to come and see, um, and to reach out to me if you guys are interested in serving, doing scripture reading, passing out the communion prayer or the communion plates, doing communion prayer. Um, I really, really encourage you guys to talk to me about it so we can get you on the list and have you guys be more involved for yourselves and for our church family. Um, if you have questions as to if you're if you've already signed up and you have questions as to where what you're signed up for because you don't know or because I may have just put you on there um, talk to me we can add you to other other parts of the of the service and do other things for you um, and if you have other questions about what how you can serve just let me know and if I if it's not something that I do then I can point try to point you guys in the right direction at least uh, thank you you are dismissed.